Hello, my name is JP Kuvan, and it's a pleasure to welcome you to this edition of the Off the Shelf podcast, a book discussion series brought to you by the Conference Board. Today, I will be talking to Patrick Hanlon to discuss his re-released classic, Primal Branding, Create Zealots for Your Brand, Company, and Your Future. What is it that made Starbucks an overnight sensation and separated it from all the other coffee houses? On the other hand, why do many products, even with great innovation, perfect location, terrific customer experience, breakthrough advertising, fail to create the same kind of visceral traction and relationship in the marketplace? You know, think of Apple and Nike as the winner, but many others struggling. Well. Patrick Hanlon is an advertising and brand strategy expert. He's the founder of social advocacy incubator Thinktopia, now Primal Branding Co., and he decided to find the answers. His search revealed seven definable assets that together construct the belief system that lies behind every successful brand, whether it's a product, service, city, personality, social cause, you name it. In Primal Branding, Patrick explores those components. He calls it the Primal Code and shows how to use and combine them to create a community of believers in which the consumer develops a powerful emotional attachment to the brand. Primal Branding presents the opportunity for marketers to move their brands from being just another product on the shelf to becoming a desired and necessary part of the culture and their life. So I hope that you are as eager now to hear about the Primal Code as I am. Thanks, Patrick, for being on the podcast. Hey, JP. Th- thanks for having me. It's great I- you were able to stop by in busy New York. I know you're busy yourself because you're right in the middle of relaunching this book, Stuff. restructuring your agency. Is that right? Yes. Primalbranding.co is, uh, just makes more of a straight line to... Uh, primal branding which we've been using a construct we've been using for 15 16 years i came up with it in uh, 2001 right and it's yeah. it's it's a great it's a great header because it really expresses um what um your model is all about as we'll see but before we get into it i want to talk a little bit about the pre-primal time if you like <laughs> at least for you yeah um how what did you do before getting to primal branding and why did you then get to like research it and write this book? Yeah, what? well, there are, I think, three kinds of people who write books. There are uh, people who are academics, professors, you know, in universities. There are people who are journalists. And then there are people who are practitioners. And I was, I am, a, was and am a print practitioner. I came out of the advertising agency world. I worked in uh famous advertising agencies here in Manhattan and elsewhere around the country. And um, really primal branding came out of a problem uh, we were facing with a client. The client was Lego. I think people know, some people know this. And, um, and I just had the, at that time, Starbucks was coming across the country from west to east, Seattle to New York. Uh, Google was around. And neither of those companies had uh, advertising. Right. And so in, in advertising meetings, we'd be trying to sell a campaign. And inevitably, there, in one form or another, someone would ask, um, you know, Google isn't advertising. They're doing great. Starbucks isn't advertising. Everyone's going to Starbucks. Starbucks. And why should we be spending $30 million on this advertising campaign? Tough question when you're right? at an advertising agency. <laughs> exactly. So there'd be this, you know, great pause in the room. And uh, the elephant had been uh, in the room. It had been unleashed. And, you know, and someone would come up with something, you know, whether it was, you know, they have great experience or, you know, they'd come up with some bullshit. And so the, but there is the question, right? And, and so... Lego was having a problem. That was not that. That was not their problem. But they, we had a, a thing going on where 
I just kind of felt in my gut that there was something amiss. And we didn't have the word authentic at that time, but they weren't being, I felt they weren't being genuine to themselves. I had been to, because I was one of the many global creative directors on Lego, I'd been to, I'd been to um, Billund, their headquarters in Denmark several times, many times. And so- Not too exciting, I should say. I've been there too. <laughs> <laughs> it's very exciting. And and they also had Legoland down in um, in Carlsbad in California, which, and they were, the two were completely different. You right. know, it was uh, their Legos, Walt Disney had built the one in Denver, in, uh, in building, excuse me. Denver has nothing to do with this. Uh, in Billund, and the in Denmark, and the one in California was frankly kind of off the shelf, you know, right. and it had none of the soul and, right. and heart and what we would take, what we would call today authenticity. And so I just thought there was something messed up there. And in fact, looking back today, historically, uh, we know that there was something messed up with Lego because that's when they were. Go- about to go out of business, right? Right. So this was 2001, late 19, 1990s, 2001 era. And so um, I had some time, people were t- talking it back then about, I've talked about this before, but just real quickly, you know, people were talking about Nike tribes and Apple cults, but no one really, really figured out how to create one for themselves other, other than by imitation, right? Which is rife in advertising. And and so people would just imitate them and uh, rather than figuring out how they could do it for their own brand, even if they weren't selling computers or sell, selling shoes, right. athletic right. sportswear. And so I did. Right. And so I came up with this idea. I vetted it with some friends. I had friends at American Express. I had friends at other agencies and uh, other people in the business. And I said, this, uh, a friend of mine worked on Apple. Uh, Craig Tanamoto and I bounced the idea off them and um, and Paul Asau who worked on Harley Davidson. I bar- so these were famous brands and I bounced the idea off of them and they thought it had it made some sense. It was totally out of the blue. To- no one was, no one was in- doing anything right. like this. But I d- deconstructed famous brands and they all had a creation story. Apple started in a garage. They all had a creed. They uh, think think different or just do it. Uh, they all had icons, whether it was an Apple, uh, the logo, or it was the product itself. Um, they all had rituals, you know, how you use this. And right. uh, everyone has a ritual if they're working out or running a marathon and so forth. There are all sorts of rituals, um, you know, uh, how we went to had coffee in the morning. Starbucks was t- totally right. re- cha- re-engineering. Yes. Yeah, re-engineering that ritual right. from having right. it at home to having it at Starbucks. Right. Now you wouldn't think right. of having it at home, right? And then put it, the cup provocatively in your hand or at the, at the desk when you come to work as an icon. Yep, ask what you were going to have. They all had a lexicon, ice grande, skinny decaf latte for Starbucks, right? Create new language. A whole new language we had to learn if right. we wanted to order coffee for Pete's sakes. And so, and, and then non-believers, uh, Apple versus PCs, Nike versus you know Adidas or or sneakers, uh, and then they all had a leader, and so when you added all those things up, you strung that together. You were basically creating a narrative, right? Which also, by the way, people weren't talking about back then. You know, this is two thousand one. Remember, uh, and so this is before. YouTube it was right. before uh, right. Facebook was around, but it was some w- weird thing that people were doing in Boston, right? And you basically and just gave us the primal code or these uh, seven so components. These, these seven things: creation right. story, creed, icons, rituals, non-believers, lexicon or uh, sacred words, uh, and the leader. You know, right. make up the, and, what we call the primal code. And, and you have your own creation story maybe you made it up to have one but i heard previously it had to do with mowing the lawn is that right oh, how i came up with primal brandy yeah sure <laughs> yeah so that's your yeah. that's yeah. your creation story yeah um uh, yeah I, I was i had this idea i was thinking about the lego thing as i was working in my garden or what they're mowing the lawn etc cetera, etc cetera. Right. mowing the lawn you know just gets rid of all the distractions <laughs> that's right. the sound right. of the engine and so uh i do a lot of writing while mowing the lawn but yeah so i was a creative director in manhattan just back right. to your question I worked on a lot of famous brands that people know and the um and so when we when I came up with this notion about primal branding, I decided not determined not to be an agency. So we don't work like an agency. Uh, so you we, founded we your, not your agency. own agency, right? With we are the, not an agency with yeah. the book. We're a brand, brand, you know, revelation company and transformation company. And um, 
we deconstruct brands and then build them back together again. Right. So we launch new products or develop new ones right. all over the world. Right. To to one more aspect of your own story, which is kind of interesting and probably is weaving into your own um, company um, legend, if you like, is that it felt intuitive. Um, it's become kind of de rigueur now, but it took a long time. And you concluded, looking at it kind of after yeah. the fact, that there was one event actually that threw it all off. Can you tell us about that? Um, in terms of the timing you of your about? book? <laughs> in terms of what? <laughs> the, the timing of the book. Um, it was uh, 2001 when your book came out. I think there was a lot of distraction, basically. From oh, that. when I came up with the idea. I'm sorry. Yes, I misunderstood. It, then my book came out in 2006. But when I, yes, when I, sorry, JP and I go back a while. A while so <laughs> <laughs> forget all we're the old stories. We're talking in code but, yeah, already. We're it's our own language. Really about the origin story. And then I want to add something after that too. But the so I came up with Primal Branding while I was working in the garden in Connecticut and um, or home in Wilton, Connecticut. And the um, that was in June and July, basically. And for those of you who know Manhattan, nothing happens in August because everyone's on vacation. They're in the Hamptons or the shore or somewhere else. They've gone somewhere else. And so I knew knew that nothing would happen in August. So I just pissed basically you know tightened up some things in August and took some time off got a couple of speaking engagements lined up and so forth and then September 1 I was back at it everyone's back at work work and calling people and so forth and then September 11th happened and no one cared about what a, a new, new idea about branding who cares and so I you know I spoke around the country and stuff so I just put it in the box of speaking uh, engagement things and um, kind of left it alone uh, but I would roll it out once in a while, and so over the years, I still thought that it worked, and um, we did, did start getting some jobs based upon it. And, uh, and as a matter of fact, our first job was an internal branding thing. People inside the company didn't know what they believed in, basically. So Primal looks at brands and belief systems, and once you create that belief system that I just outlined, you, you attract other, others who share your beliefs, right? So. Essentially, it's purpose-driven, mission-driven, and all these things. And I would go at that those during those speeches that I would give back in 2002, three, four, and so forth. You know, I talk about your brand being a community. Once you build the belief system, attracts others who share your beliefs. That builds community, right? And they would stare at me like the like I was talking about the church or something, mm -hmm. right? And um, or minorities or something like that, you know. And so the um, a minority program and 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 so there I'd be talking to a room full of uh, people you know a hundred people thousand people and they'd have X's in their eyes and and but but there were also positive comments too and today today of course we take right. the fact that you're building a community social community for granted right. you know we take it granted that you're building advocacy right. we take it for granted that there'll be word of mouth and and looking at uh, brands we mentioned two earlier nike apple but you can also extend that to whatever facebook airbnb or whatever um and it's not comparing it, that to a church is not so uh, strange or such a long shot anymore if you think about people camping out to try and get in uh, you know using these uh, products like totems to define themselves finding meaning in brands so there are a lot of that, parallels aren't there that's oh yeah it's always been the case and people are talking about uh uh, writers were talk, journalists were talking about people having religious zeal over Apple or um, or Nike. Yeah, and camping out, you know, for the right. iPhones, you know, the so, new iPhones and all that. And the other thing that I should point out is that just in terms of our creation story, um, after the book uh, was published and so forth, I got this strange email out of the blue from a guy, some guy in Singapore, somewhere in Asia, I can't remember exactly where, who worked for Unilever. And he, and he said that um, the seven points of primal branding, pieces of primal branding code, were consistent with his own research that he'd done for uh, all the luxury brands, over 100 luxury brands, and that was you. 
So <laughs> that it note, was out, it was out of Singapore. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. So that note came in at an important time. So yeah, thank I'm, you. No, no I, and um, because it, it was, it, 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 was, was almost, it was it was it was it was amazing and it was uh, 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 strange and embarrassing at the same time because literally we did a very broad research at the time, and then I stumbled over this book. Um, and I'm like, wow, this is amazing to which extent we f find this in a lot of case studies that we did. So, so that, that was uh, amazing. And, and I wanted you to talk about September 11 uh, simply because it also shows how external events, how culture, how context can totally change the path of brands, of, of community building, etc. Um, and maybe in this case, the whole discussion and realization of brands needing to be meaningful beyond the material, as mm -hmm. I like to call it, uh, because such shocking events came in between it all. Yeah. Um, but to go back to, to the... It's not just products and services, though. People use this. I mean, you're building communities. So you're building communities if you, for your, around yourself, right? Friends, family, and so forth. You're building communities around places cities you know there's a reason why people live in brooklyn instead of manhattan and vice versa or silver lake out in los angeles right right and so the uh, they have all, all these are embedded with the seven pieces of code that's what makes one right person place or thing right more so I, I, th I think we talk quite a bit about creation story and it's probably the one that um people are the most familiar with or feel the most uh, intuitively fitting with branding, particularly coming out of luxury where they talk a lot about their history and their mm -hmm. creation. But talk to me about Creed, particularly if you can give us an example of, of a brand or several brands that are particularly good at this. Um, Creed is an unusual uh, word to use in the context of brand building. Oh, sure. Uh, well, Creed is really our purpose. It's our reason for being. It's why we come to work in the morning. And it's really, it's the why. It's what Simon Sinek calls the why. Um, but he does, there are the other pieces going that go around that too, you know, six other things. And so it's not just about the why, but the why is a, certainly a, a something to focus on. and A good question to start out with. Well... It's a good question to start out with, and it's one that sometimes is never really resolved. And the um, so it's difficult sometimes, depending on the company, to, I mean, so often we try to take um, what I would call, uh, well, techniques like primal branding and, for example, as one example, or the why, and run them through our organization no matter what, as if it's going to, because it worked at, at this place over here on the other side of the country or the other side of town or the other side of the world it's going to work for our company right and that's not true i don't think every each company is individual and so what this tries to get at is eking out that brand personality what are we here for mm -hmm. um, all companies have i mean all seven of these pieces of code Primal code are unique. They're differentiating, right. and you can build off of them. You can build content off of them, and um, and that's critically important who, who, to the who's whole good thing, at this especially because today. To get yeah, to get back to answer your question, you know, the ones you expect, you know, Amazon, Nike, uh, uh, Apple, and so forth, because okay. they um, are able to. You can design a comp company around primal branding. Right. I understand yeah, with, Apple with zero dollars. Yeah. You can do it with zero dollars, and and we have. Right. I understand but, Apple. But you you say Amazon, but many people would describe it as soulless. But, so almost like without a creed. You can do this for zero dollars, but it helps to have money. And the reason it helps to have money is that I mean you can start organically with zero dollars build the code, here's where we're from, here's what we're about, here's what represents us, here's how you use us, here's what we're not, never want to become, here's our own special language, here's the team that's, you, that's leading the whole thing. You can pull all, pull all of that together, uh, whip together a website, and, and put that out there in front of the world. Mm -hmm. But the problem is, is that you need to be talking about all seven of those things in order to give people the sense that you do have a community, that you do, that there is a there there. And for that, it helps if you have money. So right. you need a budget to fill 
those pieces. Right, right. And so the um, those with money are able to do that. And so the to have that billion dollars, like Coca Cola or you know other people, right. um, permits them to have this feed, that constant engagement, where they're always telling us about what's right. going on. So every day, do you have an Apple? Yes. Phone? iPhone? So every day you get something about, you hear something about the Apple stock price, you hear something about the old phone, the new phone, you hear might hear something about Tim Cook, you might hear something about their new headquarters or uh, ITV or something, but because it is, um, about product design, it's about personality brand, it's about the finance, you know, stock price, uh, and about all these other things. It's not like the Energizer Bunny pounding away at you, right? right. And so that, and, and Amazon is able to do that, Nike's able to do that. Right. So you need money to do that, yeah. and to have that constant surround so, is, the so thing, is the thing that you sh every brand needs to right. go after. So I understand having money is a, is, is a good thing, can, can be very helpful. But again, on many of these brands, I'm thinking of Amazon, I'm thinking on Uber, I'm thinking of uh, even Coca-Cola that you mentioned. Don't we see that a lot of people um, turn away or at least become neutral because they say, I'm seeing through this now. Coca-Cola wants me to be happy. Um, you know, Amazon wants me to be comfortable. But they're saying, I want a little bit more from a brand now. I want a little bit more of a soul. Like, what are you standing for? For example, being reminded with the whole MBA discussion right now. So I'm for civil liberties and social justice or whatever, unless it loses me money in China. Mm -hmm. um, is, there, is there relation to that? Is it really only about money and defining or should it also be about you know, how you approach it. Um, we'll make a little break to let you think about it and to get some messages out. Uh, we'll be right back and continue this discussion with uh, Patrick after these short messages. Can you, your team, or your company benefit from insights such as the ones provided in this podcast? They are immediately available when you join the conference board a membership-based think tank that delivers trusted insights for what's ahead. Reaching across industries and geographies, we bring together our noted experts, senior executives from the world's largest companies, and nonpartisan practical research to help you address your most important business issues. Our membership packages are tailored to your organization's unique needs and budget. To learn more about our offerings, go to www.conferenceboard.org and click join on the top bar to connect with one of our product specialists. Hello and welcome back to our conversation today with uh, Patrick Hanlon and his book, Primal Branding. Um, so Patrick, what do, you, what do you say? Is it just kind of any kind of creed? Does it have a certain structure? What did you find? Well, I think that you have to know why you exist and your, your point of differentiate. That has to be a point of differentiation. There has to be a reason for you to come in work and work every day. You want people who are engaged and they have to be engaged around your mission, your culture, your uh, reason for being, as I mentioned earlier before the break. And that whole thing has to be, I mean, people are looking for purpose and looking for meaningful work. And the thing is, is that when you have a job, if you're a person that has a job, you're living inside someone else's story, all right? And so that story has to be meaningful, okay. right? And I think that the, um, because you want a life with meaning, and that meaning can't be just when work is done, when you punch out, right. right? And so the it's much more, which is why people work at places that have more meaning and they'll work for less, you know, fewer dollars maybe. At least if they can afford to. If they can afford to, yeah, at yes. a certain level. And so um, so that's important. Gotcha. Yeah, for sure it's important. And I think that the companies that are doing that, that well, you know, Patagonia, obviously, um, Amazon might be doing some things that are right, you know, um, a few others are off right. the grid. 
You know? I'm, I'm and just I thinking think of, of of these tricky situations that we hear about now from like let's say Google workers working out and saying I don't want to work for a company that works with uh, TSA or whatever it might yeah. be. Yeah. How to think about that? You yeah, know, I, I think it has to do with a, a strong sense of creed in this case, right? Doesn't yeah, it? absolutely. Yeah. Right. And that was the problem with Lego too. They'd lost their way, and companies um, frequently lose their way after their founders leave, or if there's a merger, or if there's um, there's you know something else is awry. There's a product thing, a product recall, and all, all of a sudden the focus shifts. You know, right? And so th there are always things like that. Right. Right. So it's hard to stay on story. Right. Let, let's switch gears a little bit. I, I want to get some short bits in here on, on the other um, elements of uh, the, the primal code. Sure. Uh, for example, icons. Um, icons, quite clear in my mind, when we talk about a Porsche 911 or a, bar, a, a Birkin bag, um, what does an icon look like when you're in the service industry, for example? Oh, it can be so many things. Yeah. I, I mean, I think the thing about icons that was revelatory for me is that, you know, people think of the logo, um, they think of the website, uh, they think of the product, but icons really engage all of the senses. And I think that was really the revelation for me. It was that it's about not just sight, you know, the lo seeing the Nike swoosh, it's about smell, it's about taste, so when you're in food. So multisensorial kind yep, of marketing. You're, you're yeah. examining taste all over the place, scent, you know, if you're right. in the, you know, so many industries. And, um, you know, Abercrombie and Fitch, <laughs> you right. know, used scent, you know, dramatically. Um, but anyway, sight, sound, taste, smell, hearing. So all of these can the constitute sound, yeah. icons. We yeah. don't. Yeah. Um, I left out of sense, but I can't remember what it is. Anyway, go and, ahead. And, and in a world rituals, in a world where it seems like we might be distanced a lot from um, where the product is made, uh, but also uh, in terms of shopping, we basically click it. Uh, we're somewhere. We're in a car. We're on a train. We're at home, and then. Um, um, nowadays, one day later, it arrives via UPS or FedEx. How do we establish rituals in this context that might express the brand? Well, those are all are all rituals. Everything you mentioned there, you know, looking but at things. But how do they differentiate? Because whether I well, uh, UX, you know, user design in influences if you're shopping online, you know, on the train, using your mobile phone. There's a whole string of rituals that have been carefully so, designed so, and so in that thought out. case for a brand that is particular mainly shopped on Amazon, it can actually be kind of a threat of losing the ability for ritual. Uh, no, I think what I'm saying is that all of those things you're moving around your thumb, all of those things and clicking, all of those things have been are ritualistic and right. have been designed hopefully to be. Uh, cleaner, smarter, faster, easier, more convenient, right, right. and going back and forth between right. uh, screens and so forth is all ritualistic. Right. No, I, I just met many brands now have uh, sometimes a large majority of their sales on Amazon, even though they are an independent fashion or jewelry or uh, a food brand of some kind. Um, it'll be the Amazon ritual. It won't be theirs. Oh, so how sure. can they build okay. in their ritual? Yeah. Uh, there are, yes, Amazon, you're right. Amazon has re changed the retail landscape in the same way that Starbucks changed the coffee re landscape years ago. And so um, what uh, so many people are trying to find ways to um, hack through or work around um, the D to C, right? right? And so they're doing it in all sorts of ways, uh, pop-up shops, making the retail experience better, more fun. Uh, the problem with um, going to retail is that, um, uh, bricks and mortar, excuse me, retail, is that uh, it takes more time. And you, if you don't have time and you're buying, uh, you're looking for shoes, you're looking for a blouse, you're looking for a dress right. for the weekend or something like that, or a book, you know, you're buy a book. Amazon. Yeah, right. That's so, but, so but much easier. I guess it explains why still a lot so of brands hold on to the flagship store, even if from I a financial perspective, it might. I think not they need to. Yeah. yeah, I think they um, they need to look at ways to become more relevant, and, and right. many of those ways have to do with the user experience. Uh, b stores themselves have gotten boring. 
Yeah, right. and you walk down the street in, in any city, major city in the world, and you have the same stores walking down Main Street, right? So, all right, understand. Um, I want to get also before we leave to the pagans and the non-believers, um, and how do you how do you target to have non-believers when you want to be or need to be a very popular market leading share kind of a brand? Yeah, do you actually create foes? Um, and how do you do that if you want to be popular? Well, uh, you probably have foes already, <laughs> even if you don't know it. It might be distribution, talking about D to C. Uh, it could be people who just don't want your brand. I think that the th classic thing, or the, the most important thing, I think, for marketers in this sense is that we never admit that there's, there are people out there who might not want to buy us. Rarely do we admit that, if ever, right? And so acknowledging that. So we focus on zealots, and then we look at potential zealots. Uh, so zealots are those people who are probably already advocates. They're already talking about us. So we want to find out who, what are the friction points that are holding the potential zealots back. So the potential zealots is our growth. Gotcha. Right? And, and um, uh, Australian marketing professor, quite provocative, uh, Byron Sharp, you know, always points out that even Coca-Cola only has 30% household penetration. Exactly. Now, in his case, <laughs> yeah. he says that's proof that there's a long way to go and that we should mass market and not segment. But you're using it in a different way by saying, hey, you know, if you play up a little bit more of your profile, you might have more zealots and people also, who are more loyal to you. Yep, right? yep. Um, um, and you're not wasting money. Sacred words, quickly. Give me a good one, one that you really like, a brand that has some good sacred words. Oh, the classic is Ice Grande Skinny Decaf Latte, oh, okay. you know, Starbucks. All you right. Can beat that. Um, but I think there are, there, are words, uh, there are words playing poker, you know, okay. sacred words. There are, uh, soccer fans know all the sacred words, uh, mm -hmm. special lexicon right. for, for that, you know. Personally, baseball. I like uh, mini cars always talking about motoring instead of driving, you know. Uh, yeah. ni nice, little, yeah. nice little twist there. Yeah. Uh, and then finally, uh, in, in, in the, your um, code here, the leader. Now, again, we keep hearing stories about, um, uh, about Steve Jobs or about Elon Musk. And many brands tell me, uh, you know, when, when they're looking for counsel and advice, well, you know, I have neither of those two. I have some professional management that kind of gets yeah. promoted on quarterly results or not. Yeah. Where is my leader? How, how do you create That's a leader a when you're part of a huge conglomerate? Yeah. And, and, the, and by the way, the new CEO used to be a CFO yes. or a CIO or engineer. who are famously, yep. you know, not a sales guys that are, want, you know, like their face put, being put out there. Uh, that can be a problem. So then you invent a mascot <laughs> or you find someone else to be your spokesperson. Do you have have but, you found somebody who has a good solution for that? I think that, no, I think that the companies that um, that we know about and hear about, they have a leader who's out in front. You know, Elon Musk is a great example. I mean, he's a self-promoter, right. you know, AAA. And so the Steve Jobs also. And I think that, um, that that's important for but a it company. Seems to, it seems to me that maybe a leader doesn't always have to be a physical person maybe it has to be a maybe it can be a group maybe it can be an ideal uh, people rally around mm -hmm. uh, and so you kind of mitigate that problem of having really professional management and not kind of a charismatic uber figure um, at the mm -hmm. top um, do you have an example of that um, yes, I think, I think, for example, you know, like always brand at Procter & Gamble, where I worked for a long time, um, uh, is very engaged in, you know, um, teenage, um, uh, uh, teenage education, uh, girl power, etc. And mm -hmm. it, it, it feels very strong, even though it, this comes from a mass merchandising conglomerate. It feels like as if they had somebody at the helm, but, yeah. you know. Um, I was just thinking this. Effort. I was just thinking the same kind of thing, you know, hashtag woke or something like that, yes. or hashtag me too. It right. doesn't really have a leader, but there's sort of right. a, a leadership thing right. going on there. Right. No and, and, what. and you have yeah. other brands like think of Icon. Old Spice, you iconic. know, that have iconic people. Yeah, uh, if you're looking for iconic people. Maybe right. you have an iconic symbol. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, I, th I think that works. Excellent. Excellent. Well, uh, it was great talking about primal branding. But before we let you go, I want to ask you one of our favorite questions here. Uh, on you mean the we're done already? We, we are. We this raced, is impossible. We raced through 
we're already over the budget here, 35 <laughs> minutes. Uh, I'm worried we'll have to cut out some content. But I wanted to ask you, like, um, when you look for inspiration um, in, in books uh, on branding, or maybe they have nothing to do with branding, what's kind of one of your favorite go-to books? Uh, well, I look for inspiration in podcasts, first okay. of all. Interesting. Okay, good. <laughs> which one you're no, which the, one you're uh, listening for? You know, uh, the Hitmakers. Okay. I forget who wrote that. Uh, the, one of the editors at Atlantic. Sorry, guy, I can't think of your name right now. Um, Hitmakers is amazing. Uh, but mo mostly, I don't read business books. I'm reading a book called Ninth Street Ninth Street Women right now, which is about uh, women artists in the 30s, 40s. Uh, they were married to the famous artists, artists De Kooning and Pollock and so forth. Right. But they were artists in their own right. That's been a fascinating read, and um, yeah, and other things. And, history uh, and stuff. Yes, and um, there is actually an expo going on right now uh, in Germany and Frankfurt on famous artist women and who are famous artists in their own right now becoming. Yep. Yep. Um, again, I think very relevant very cool. for brand builders because the cultural context is a very strong influence on brand building. Absolutely. Uh, with that, um, Patrick, I want to thank you again. Before we go, how can people get in touch with you? What's the easiest, short, UX-friendly way? Uh, primalbranding.co, C-O, not dot com, is one way. And uh, our Instagram is at primalbranding. Excellent. S Thanks again. And, uh, it's Patrick Hanlon. I'm easy to find. Hanlon. H-A-N-L-O-N. Um, so thanks again for um, stopping by and you, dear listener, for tuning in. Uh, if you enjoyed this episode, please remember to subscribe to our Off the Shelf a book discussion podcast or explore the entire catalog of podcasts here at the conference board influencers is another favorite of mine um, you can see them on our website at www.conference-board.org forward slash podcast how is that for not complex um, and uh, we'll talk to you next time wiedersehen goodbye thanks jp <laughs> <laughs>